Hi everyone. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, masquerading code in Etherscan, or uh, hiding code, hiding code, and uh, not showing what's really going to run. And as everyone here probably knows, uh, when starting to interact with a new contract, it's a common practice to look at uh, to look at the verified code in Etherscan to understand what it's going to do and assess whether it's uh, whether it can be trusted. And of course, uh, scammers know this too. So the question is, can they, can they pull this rug from under us? And it turns out that they, uh, they can and they often do. So what we're going to show here is uh, a couple of techniques, uh, a couple of techniques uh, that are used to uh, bait and switch, to show, uh, to show you legitimate code, but actually run something else. And then we're going to show an actual, uh, an, an actual vulnerability that was exploited on mainnet and, uh, and was missed by auditors uh, due to such uh, techniques. The most obvious case is, um, the most obvious uh, way to do it is to hide a bug in plain sight. And it's made possible by the fact that uh, you can verify any, you can, when you're verifying a contract on Etherscan, you can upload any number of uh, Solidity files that you import, even if these files have nothing to do with your, uh, uh, with your bytecode. So you can upload huge code. Most of it uh, is not actually used, but it can overwhelm the auditor. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then some vulnerability can be uh, well hidden inside. It's uh, also, uh, uh, in many cases, there would be multiple implementations of some functions in different files. And it can be quite difficult for an auditor, even for an experienced auditor, to find out which one is actually going to be used in each uh, situation. So we demonstrated it here by deploying this DEX, which is uh, more than uh, 7,000 lines of code. Most of this code, of course, is unused. It was just uploaded as part of uh, verification. And inside it, there's, uh, there is one small bug uh, well hidden. Let's look at it. So this contract is ownable, and it has a transfer ownership function. There are multiple implementations that inherit from, uh, inherit from, own from ownable, and we see transfer ownership. So the first two versions are fine. The third implementation is almost fine, but it's missing the, it's missing the only owner modifier, which means, that, um, which means that basically anyone can take over this contract. Uh, another, form, uh, another form of uh, attack is using a fake proxy. So Etherscan has this uh, nice feature where it recognizes standard proxies like EIP-1967. Uh, it recognizes transparent proxies and it shows you the implementation. And uh, it's common to rely on that. Now it's great for UX, it's not so great for security because they have no way to detect, uh, to detect uh, fake proxies. So proxies that uh, seem to point to a legitimate implementation, but actually in some situations or maybe always use a different implementation. So it's going to show us the wrong implementation. And here we see such a proxy. It looks like a standard proxy, but you can see that it, uh, uh, you can see that it has the standard implementation slot, but when you call the get implementation internally, it's actually going to bring the implementation from a different slot. And let's see what it looks like on, uh, on, uh, on Etherscan. So we deployed it, and it is uh, recognized as a, it's recognized as a standard proxy, and we see the implementation address. Oh, sorry. So it's recognized as a, it's recognized as a proxy. We see the implementation address, and below you can see the code in this uh, implementation address. There's a function called check, and it returns one. But then if you, look at the, if you look above it, you see that we call check and we actually got zero. That's because the implementation that's being shown to us is not the implementation that's actually being used. A more interesting version of this is what I call the non-proxy proxy. It's, um, it's a contract that seems immutable, and uh, it seems immutable, and you don't think of it as a proxy. It can be some uh, ERC-20 token or something, 
and it inherits from uh, multiple contracts, and each of these contracts can inherit from a couple more. So you can have a very complex inheritance tree. And somewhere deep inside uh, this tree, you can have a fallback function. You can have a, a hidden fallback function that delegates, to a, that delegates to some other address. So effectively, the entire contract becomes a proxy for unimplemented functions. So anything that is outside the ABI will, uh, will try to delegate to that contract. And uh, at the time of deployment, it can be well hidden because, uh, you, because you can make it counterfactual. So when you deploy it and when the code gets audited and evaluated by users, there is nothing in the delegated address, which means that if you try to call something uh, outside the ABI, it's going to revert because that's what Solidity does when you try to uh, make a call to uh, something with no code. So it will revert. But then later, you can deploy the contract at any time. Uh, you can anytime deploy it and add new functionality to the contract. So what we're demonstrating here is an ERC-20 token, and it, has, uh, it, ha it inherits from some contract. And if you look at some contract, you see that it has this uh, small fallback function that delegates to a hard-coded address. And there was nothing in this address at the time of deployment. But later, we deploy something. So if you look at the ABI on the left, you see that there is no mint function because it's not a part of the ABI. But if you decompile the, if you decompile the new code, you see that it has two new functions, one of them being the mint function which allows us to mint any number of uh, tokens. And that's what we did here. So we demonstrated that uh, we start from an address with uh, no tokens, and we call it manually because it can't be done from the UI because it's not part of the ABI, but you call mint manually, and now we have a lot of tokens, which we can use to drain the, uh, to drain the liquidity pool in Uniswap for that uh, token. Uh, another interesting case is selector collisions. So uh, the way Solidity encodes functions is by hashing them and using the, fr and using the first four bytes, hashing the, the function signature and using the first four bytes. And four bytes is not a lot, so it's easy to find a collision. Now, when you have a collision between a proxy and an implementation, the proxy will take precedence. So it allows you to uh, hide any function and I mean, cover it with a different function. And it doesn't have to be something that looks uh, very suspicious. It actually can look very harmless. So we demonstrate it here by using, uh, by the, we have this uh, simple vault implementation. It's a vault, it has a, it has a mapping of uh, vault managers and functions for adding and removing uh, managers which can only be called by the current managers. So this contract is uh, supposedly safe. And here's a proxy to it. And the proxy seems like a standard proxy except this small pure function at the bottom called image URL. So image URL is a pure function that returns true or it could return some string or whatever. Now an auditor might wonder uh, why does this proxy have this pure function, but most people wouldn't care about it too much because it's just you know, a pure function, it doesn't touch the state, it only returns true, so how bad can it be? Well, it turns out that it can be quite bad because it shares the first four bytes uh, of the hash with the vault manager's uh, map, uh, mapping getter, which means that now you're going to return true for, any, uh, for anything you check in this uh, mapping. So here we have this, uh, we have a number vault. It's a vault that has a number that anyone can read, but only managers should be able to change it. And it's using this uh, proxy vault. And when we, um, and if we check it, we see that any address is going to return true because of the image URL function. So we were able to change the number from an address that is not supposed to be a manager. So anyone can actually, uh, can actually act as a manager on this contract. And uh, another form, of, uh, another form uh, of such attacks is to have a 100% legit code, not mess with the code in any way, but mess with the storage. And a, a legitimate, contract with, uh, legitimate contract with bad uh, storage, with compromised storage, is still a compromised storage. So, well, um, so you can compromise the storage during initialization, or if there is a delegate call somewhere in the code, you can also do it later. And when looking at the storage, it's really hard to know what it's really hard to know what this storage means because of the way mapping is uh, uh, is built in Solidity. So you see that there is something in some random slot. You don't know what it is until it's actually used. 
And I'm demonstrating it here using, um, uh, using Gnosis safe. So we, have a, so we deployed a safe, and it's using the, uh, uh, this safe, uh, is, it's a Gnosis safe uh, proxy factory, so it uses the official factory. And we, we make a call to the official factory, and we use the official singleton, the official implementation. So all the code is, uh, is the Gnosis safe code. There is nothing uh, fishy about the code itself. And if we look at their UI, we can see that it has one signer. Uh, yeah, so it has one signer. And this signer, is, um, so this signer is supposed to be the only one that can transact. In Etherscan, we're also, we can also see that uh, get, owner, get owners return only this address. But below, you can see a different address. And there are actually 20, uh, 20 more signers that are not visible. But they return true when you call uh, is owner. That's because of the that's because the get owner uses a linked list, but is owner actually uses a mapping. So these users can actually transact. And here we sent a transaction from such uh, uh, from, from a such address, and the transaction is successful. If you look at Etherscan, you see that execution was successful, even though it is signed by a different uh, it's signed by a, by a different address that should not be able to transact. And now Oren is going to present an actual real-life case. OK, so uh, I'll dive right into it. Uh, I have uh, a, little, a bit more than six minutes, and I'll, I'll make it. Uh, OK, a bit of orientation. Uh, Chainswap was a cross-trained bridge. It was active in uh, 2021 up to late uh, 2021. And it was hacked twice uh, in, in about a week. Uh, and, and we're talking today about the second hack. First hack was uh, 800K stolen. And the second hack was uh, $4.4 million hacked. And basically, after the hack, uh, there were a few explainers that were published. Some talked about sloppy authentication checks. Some, talks about, some talked about uh, something wrong in the uh, increasing of the uh, quota. But basically, they either got it wrong or didn't uh, touch the, the spot. So let's find out why. Uh, and we start with looking at the attacker's transaction. And we see that the attacker's transaction in Etherscan is basically interacting with uh, Chainswap's proxy, which directs them to uh, a verified contract. Now, it doesn't show here, but basically we find and we, we managed to found an identical contract to this verified contract, which was audited. So it's not only verified, but it's even audited. Uh, and now we go to Tenderly to see if, uh, if, if the transaction behaves uh, the same way and, and go step by step. But we see that eventually the hacker calls the receive function in the proxy, uh, in, in terms of proxy, and, but eventually it ends up in another uh, contract, right? We see here a different address. And the address, when we go to Etherscan, we see that this uh, is, a, is an unverified contract and, and closed source. So we see that something behaves differently from what Etherscan shows us. And basically, what, what happens there is that the hacker calls the proxy, Chainswap proxy. It calls another proxy, which, called, which is called the factory contract. He calls another contract, which is called the factory implementation contract, together with this uh, string that we see here. By the way, this is the name of the verified contract, so it's the same name, but eventually it gets another address, which is the address of the uh, unverified contract, and eventually the call is delegated to that contract. So basically, already here we see that there is an incoherency between what Etherscan shows us and what actually happens on chain. So let's dig in a little, dig in a little di deeper to understand the root cause. So when we look at the verified code, we see that Receive function does a few authentication checks, then called decrease auth quota, which naturally checks your uh, quota. And auth quota of is a mapping. So naturally, it defaults to zero. And when you look at the code, you see that only authenticated uh, players can increase the quota. So, so far, so good. But again, the transaction behaves differently. And we saw it uh, because you see a few different uh, strings that do not appear in the, in the source code. So we looked for these strings and found them in another contract, uh, also used by uh, Chainswap. And there, auth quote of is no longer a mapping, but now it's a function. And when you look at, you look at the function, you also see that you see auth quota, auto quota ratio and period, which are those strings, and all kinds of uh, computations, divisions, multiplications, and so on. But instead of, of looking at, at the code, we just went to Etherscan and tried to query how much uh, quota do we have, how much the quota does the attacker have, and so on. And basically, uh, you see here, every ad address that you check has uh, 10 in the power of 22, which is basically unlimited quota. 
So everybody gets unlimited quota, and this was the situation for, for a week, ever since the uh, unverified contract was deployed to the moment that uh, it was hacked. So to wrap this up, uh, basically what was supposed to happen is that the hacker calls the proxy contract, which, which calls token mapped verified contract. Seems very legitimate, but in practice, this whole mess of calling the proxy, which calls another proxy, which calls the factory, which returns the address, and, and eventually delegates to the closed source contract. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, just to conclude, so we presented a few techniques uh, that confuses either auditors or Etherscan users about the code in Etherscan and what really happens in, in, in on-chain. And we have also seen a real-life vulnerability that was exploited uh, and ended up in $4.4 .4 million uh, of loss. And, and eventually, it's a cat and mouse game, right? There, there will always be new techniques and new ways that uh, hackers will be able to trick auditors and, and, and users. So you must uh, keep up. That's it. Thanks. It's great, great, great and interesting stuff. I think a lot of questions. Guys, please, hands up. There I can see. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Can you please iterate a bit more on how the Gnosis Safe example worked with the multiple signers? Uh, yes, so if you look at the code, the, the safe code, uh, the way it uh, saves, and it has a data structure that it uses for signers and for modules, that is, uh, it seems to be like a linked list where it's actually stored and uh, the addresses are, uh, are saved in a uh, mapping but the map, there is a link list pointing to this mapping. So get signers, uh, get signers is going to get you whatever is linked in the link list. But of course, uh, when they actually check for a signer, they don't need to, go to traverse a list. They can do it in order of one. They just uh, check if something is in the mapping. So you can have things that are in the mapping, but not, uh, uh, but not in the link list. And, uh, if, and by looking at the storage, it's impossible to know what it means because uh, the, way Solidity, the way Solidity handles mapping is by uh, doing a catch, like hashing the base slot of the mapping and the, and the key. So if you look at a certain slot, but it was written directly in assembly and it was not a uh, way mapping, you are unable to, uh, to tell which mapping it is a part of, what it actually means. So you can't ascribe a meaning to, a, a meaning to this slot. It's just some uh, value that appears in some random slot. So during initialization, I created 20 such, uh, 20 such slots. I could also do it later by uh, making some delegate call uh, from the safe. And then uh, you, can have a, you can add signers or modules, and, and, and it's impossible to know what they are until someone actually abuses it. But uh, this, is a, uh, this will become irrelevant uh, soon, specifically for SAFE, because they are working on removing uh, all delegate call, which is great. All right, thank you. Um, hello. Um, question I had, uh, two quick questions. Um, one, uh, we explained that when there's some non-standard proxy, then Etherscan will go and ask like, what this is the implementation and uh, query that. Uh, why doesn't it just uh, query the view function of this contract? Like, I, I guess then, then even if there's some non-standard proxy, you could get the actual result. And the second question, uh, when you gave the collision example, uh, doesn't yeah. the on-chain so source code would be different if than the code that was verified with the pure uh, image URL function? Okay, so for the first question, uh, it was... Uh, uh, what, what, what was it again? Uh, I, I sorry, one? sorry for interrupting. Ah, okay. We have sorry. a strict yeah. schedule for today, so applauses for okay, this. Will, uh... Various of the light side, I think for this DEFI summit, we are better protected from these dark side people who find new methods to hack us. One more time, applauses.